accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, PL 1975, Chapter 231, adequate notice of this regular meeting of the Board of Adjustment of the Township of Franklin has been provided. Would you call the roll, please? Raymond Bettervid. Here. Laura Grauman. Here. Donald Johnson. Here. Bruce McCracken. Here. Alan Rich. Here. Robert Shepard. Here. Anthony Caldwell. Gary Rosenthal. Here. Joel Reese. Here. Cheryl Bagallo. Here. And Chairman Thomas. Here. Minutes of the regular meeting, June 15th. Move it. Or second? Second. All right. Raymond Bettervid. Yes. Laura Grauman. Yes. Donald Johnson. Yes. Bruce McCracken. Yes. Alan Rich. Yes. Gary Rosenthal. Yes. Joel Reese. Yes. Cheryl Bagallo. Yes. And Chairman Thomas. Yes. Resolutions. <coughs> Magosapak, CBA 170010. Second. Second. Raymond Bettervid. Yes. Laura Grauman. Yes. Donald Johnson. Yes. Bruce McCracken. Yes. Alan Rich. Yes. Gary Rosenthal. Yes. And Chairman Thomas. Yes. Trust under Article 6, Sigmund Summer, 11 properties, ZBA 15-00017. Raymond Federbid. Yes. Laura Grauman. Yes. Donald Johnson. Yes. Alan Rich. Yes. Gary Rosenthal. Yes. Chairman Thomas. Yes. Um, vouchers, September monthly retainer, 865. Is there a motion? Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Aye. Motion carried. Hearings, Gill Petroleum, ZBA 170008. Site plan with use and sign variances in which the applicants proposing to construct a two story mixed use commercial building, 791 and 8, 799 and 821. Hamilton Street, Block 229, Lots 5 through 9, and 10.01 in the HBD zone, carried to October 5th with no further notification needed. If you're here for that, that application will not be heard till October 5th. And no further notice will be sent. The next application, CC Hamilton, ZBA 170013, site plan with use variance in which the applicants proposing to construct residential and retail mixed use buildings at 745 Hamilton Street and 1 Martin Street, Somerset, blocks 2223 and 224, lots 22 to 31, 1 to 12, 28 to 33. This again carried to October 5th with no further notification. Again, if you're here for that application, it's not going to be heard this evening. The first one we will hear, Kyle Porter, ZBA 170016, hardship variance in which the applicants seeking permission to build an addition at 46 Vermont Avenue, Franklin Park, Block, 40, block 55, Lot 10 in the R20 zone. And You can come sit table. down. Need to pick up a, uh, a mic and make sure it's working. Yes, thank you. Hello? Yep. That's it, you got it. Okay, I'm going to swear you in if you'll raise your right hand. Solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. State your name. Kyle Porter. Would you just give us an overview quickly what you want to do? I'm trying to put an addition on the side of my house. Uh, it's a two-story or one-and-a-half-story addition. Um, trying to build it flush with the front of the house, which sits at just over 30 feet off the uh, property line in the front. The setback is 35, so I'm just looking for permission to build off the side of my house. Mr. And Chairman? The, the new addition now, the front yard setback variance that's a new one yeah but what's if you see on the site plan that's on the first the first sheet uh, that shows the existing house it, sh uh, it shows that they're basically going to keep that existing setback and kind of expand to the right 
uh, keeping the 31 foot setback, but 35 happens to be required. That's the reason that's the new variance. Um, it otherwise complies in terms of building coverage. It's well under in terms of impervious coverage. And the second sheet uh, is the rendering that shows what the house would look like. Um, in my opinion, I think it's a rather attractive addition to the house, keeping with the character of the house. But it's the technically, since they're currently non-conforming in terms of front yard setback, and they're going to have more building within that setback, they need the variance. Okay. And were you able to read what the uh, comments on on this application? Uh, the survey needs to identify the location of the well. I did. Uh, There's a note concerning the impervious coverage, one regarding soil that cannot be imported or removed from the site until a permit's been obtained from the township, and an as-built survey by a licensed uh, surveyor prior to a certificate of occupancy. Were, did, were, did you get that information? The survey is just what I got from the township when I originally purchased the house. Now you'll need, to, once, the, once the property is completed, you'll have to have a surveyor come out and provide a new survey that demonstrates that the house as newly constructed is what the same as what was approved. Okay. Did you, I bet you didn't get this. These are the comments, and this is what you're going to need to do. And for number three, since you're under a thousand square feet, I believe it doesn't. I don't think it applies to you. Those are those are four conditions. If an approval is granted, that you have to meet. Is that we? Th I guess we threw the information at you pretty. Out of, the, out of the left field, so. It's, it's all pretty standard. Um, these comments are about as basic as they get. I mean, th these are basically requirements even for just a standard building permit. Okay. Any questions from any, anyone? Anybody need any more information? We're open to the public. Is there anybody who would like to ask a question or make a statement concerning the application? And we'll close. There are no board members who need anything further. I would entertain a motion. Move the approval. Second. Raymond Betterbid? Yes. Laura Grauman? Yes. Donald Johnson? Yes. Bruce McCracken? Yes. Alan Rich? Yes. Robert Shepard? Yes. And Chairman Thomas? Yes. Good luck. Okay, good luck with it. Is, uh, the other application we'll be hearing tonight, the foundation of Oscar and Ella Wolf Campus for Senior Living, CBA 170011. This is a site plan with hardship and use variances in which the applicant proposes to amend the 2013 approval office building modified from a one-story structure to a two-story structure parking lot and vehicular circulation the new parking lots now proposed on the same side of the access drive as the building and it's proposed between the proposed building and the existing hedgerow at 360 demont lane somerset block 386.07 lot 54.06 in the r20 zone okay I start singing when I'm holding a microphone, though, I have to warn you folks. <laughs> for the record, Larry Calley on behalf of the applicant, the Oscar and Ella Wolf Campus for Senior Living. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you pretty much did my case for me, so we don't have much to do here tonight. Um, that was a great recitation of, of what we're doing here. Um, I don't think we'll affirmatively take up all that much of the board's time. We were here a few years ago. I think most of the board members were part of that case. 
correct at the time. Um, tonight is, is a mere amendment, and I'll explain why, in my opinion. I think it's a mere amendment. Uh, what I'd like to do for a few minutes, Mr. Chairman, is explain um, who we are, what we're doing here, tell you who our few witnesses are going to be, and then just go from there. And we can certainly answer any questions of the board to the extent that we're brief in our direct presentation. But again, it's That's relatively fine. simple what we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, for the record's sake, it's 360 DeMott Lane. Um, the, it's part of a larger campus, part of a 60-acre campus, as the board knows. We offer many services for um, folks who are in the later stages of life, independent senior living right up and through the final days that, that you know, folks are, are here with us. Um, campus offers many great services. They've been in this community for decades. Um, they continue to do great things, and nothing about what we're doing here tonight is novel or changing what is already done on the campus today. Very similar to what we were doing in 2013 is an interior lot improvement. One of the lots on the campus is about a 10 acre lot. In 2013, we came to this board with a proposal for an office building, single story office building on the lot. And we explained to the board that it was a need for our folks, our personnel primarily, um, to breathe a little better, stretch out a little more. We're in really close and tight quarters now. Um, federal regulations for storage retention are only growing. We have documents and documents um, in mandatory storage. Um, our personnel are in really tight quarters. It's cramped. It's, it's sort of mentally unhealthy to be that way. Um, we needed more office space. So we came to this board for relief to construct a one-story, pretty large office structure for our existing operations and personnel on the campus. We came to this board because we're in the R20 zoning district. It's a residential zone. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that this campus is fully developed and has been here for years, it's not principally per permitted in the zone. So we came here. Um, at the time, incidentally, we had discussions with your staff about maybe rezoning this property in the future so that we wouldn't have to bother this board with variance relief every time the campus decided to put a shovel in the ground, um, especially considering we were already there. But uh, we left that for another day. But we did start those discussions with Mr. Healy at the time and our planner. Nevertheless, we presented our case to the board, and in a single evening, the board voted unanimously and favorably to approve the office structure on the property. What's changed since then? Well, since 2013, uh, that one-story structure hasn't been realized. It was never built. Um, the campus um, and their management team sort of reimagined the building and said, well, if we can fund it a little better, could it look a little nicer? Could it be a little more functional? Can it look sharper overall? Um, from an operational and functionality standpoint, they reimagined it with an architect. The old building was modular, if you recall. It was coming up in pieces from Alabama or Georgia. It gets assembled on site. And it's a box, a utility box that you might see on the back of Rutgers campus somewhere, let's say, where you've got overflow office buildings. Um, not incredibly beautiful, but it would work, and it made sense here on the campus. The applicant went back with their architect this time and said, if we don't do modular, if we build ground up, what could it look like? They came up with a two-story model, conforms in height, looks like a clubhouse, looks like a residential building. It's beautiful. It's oriented different to the road. Makes more sense than the old proposal in many ways. But the fact that we came to this board for a site plan review and use variance relief means we're amending that now with this new building, even though it works better. We're mitigating coverage. Everything overall is an improvement. Notwithstanding that, we're before this board for amended site plan relief. So the use of the building, I will tell you, does not change. It looks nicer. Looks a lot nicer. You'll see it tonight. You've seen some um, black and white elevations in your plans. But the use doesn't change. It's still servicing the campus as it exists today, our personnel, um, the functions we do. There's no new uses, no new users, no new employees. Same as it was in 2013, just a different looking building, oriented different on the same lot that was approved last time. So what I'd like to do, Mr. Chairman, uh, unless there are any questions from the board at this point, are introduce you to the first of our two witnesses. We're going to call Bill Lane, our civil engineer. Bill's been involved with this site for nearly 20 years now, um, helping developing it. Um, along the many genesis of, of the projects that have happened on this campus. Bill was involved with the prior application. He designed the prior site plan. Bill is going to explain to the board um, where the proposed structure is going, very similar to last time, the accessory improvements, and Bill is going to show you the elevations and renderings of what this building is going to look like now. Uh, I think the board will appreciate it as a much nicer looking product um, and appreciate the need for our, our goals to uh, make it look and function better. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that it causes us to come back to this board to do so. Our second witness will be our planner, because technically we still have the variance relief to explain to this board why it's justified here. Uh, it's a two-story office, um, complies in height, 
um, complies an area. Coverage still works, but it's an office building in a residential zone. And despite the fact that this board said in 2013 unanimously, this makes sense to us, we approve it. Uh, we think that the planning proof should be reestablished to a certain extent for this board to be comfortable with granting that relief again tonight. So you'll hear from Paul Rieke, our second and final witness tonight. Uh, Paul, to the extent necessary, can reconfirm the operations that I proffer to the board. It's regular office operations for our campus, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 kind of thing. Uh, but Paul can take you through that a little bit as well. And that, I think, at that point, Mr. Chairman, will conclude our, our direct case. Any questions for this gentleman? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me swear I'm in. Yes, please. Raise your right hand. So let me swear affirm, tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes. Tell me your name for the record. William Lane. Mic to your lips. Is that mic working? Testing, testing. Not going to share with you. We're not. No, it's not. Yes, it okay, yeah. I'm good. Okay. How many engineers to turn on a microphone? <laughs> <laughs> So, Bill, before before we get going, I think we need to either uh, we need to qualify you and take take you, take the board through your credentials. Um, although I know you've testified here many times, would you give the board briefly the background of your benefit and experience? Yeah, um, I've been employed by Menlo Engineering for 32 years. I've been a licensed engineer in the state of New Jersey for 20 years. Um, like Larry said, I've worked on this. Okay, that works. Let's Thank go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Bill, you've heard my my explanation to the board as to why we're here this evening. If you could um, take the board through a, a brief tour uh, of the campus utilizing what we'll shortly mark as an exhibit um, over there um, and then describe for the board the proposed improvements, the location of the building and, and everything related to it, if you would, please. If, if you just do me a favor, could you angle the board? I'm, I'm right here, sorry. Could you angle the board a little bit just so the public can see it? And sure. if the public, if you want to see it, you're, you're probably going to have to move up. Just not everybody in the room is going to be able to see it if you're back there. And can that's the board's... No now the board can't see Just yeah, That's too much. You can see it, but it doesn't look like it. A little bit forward that way. You're closer. Yeah. Out here, you are right. Very good. good. Would it be uh, possible to bring it just a Mr. little Kelly? bit closer? It needs to be closer. It needs to be closer so we can see it. Right now, it looks like a big sort of Blur. finger painting. Certainly. I guess, Bill, maybe if you can bring it up, I guess, and get it, I guess, maybe closer to Mark and angle it so everybody can. Yeah, but they're, they're doing it on that side. I don't need to see it. Uh -huh. Is that better? For everybody but Mark, yeah. Are you okay down, down here? <laughs> <laughs> Up and sits in the first two. Oh, you're all right? Okay. Okay, currently the site is accessed off of DeMott Lane. Uh, there's a private boulevard called Levison Boulevard. It just accesses the site. It comes in about 500 feet to the east, and then it separates, and it comes down to the south to the senior... Uh, six-story housing complex. Uh, just to the north of that, there's a 57-car parking uh, lot, which exists today. And then beyond where the curve starts in Levison Boulevard, there's an access drive, which leads to the uh, assisted living facility off to the east. Uh, just to the west of that, there's a 40-car parking sp a lot that services that assisted living facility. Uh, what the Wolf Campus is proposing to do is sort of like in between the two uses, provide a, uh, a new 12,000 square foot office building. Uh, with that building, we're looking to put an additional seven spaces to the south of it, which will tie into the existing 57 car parking space. And then to the north of it, we're going to provide a, an additional lot of about 53 parking spaces. Uh, we have a walkway that leads into the building from that parking lot, and then also over to the assisted living facility where a lot of the offices that are gonna be relocated are coming from there. Uh, this way, there's, there could be access between the two buildings. Were, were these additional park? Hello. Yes. Were these additional parking spaces part of the original variance granted, or are you this an additional uh, variance that's required here? The original proposal was for 49 spaces, so we're we're creating 60 spaces. Based on the ordinance with the building addition, we needed 60 spaces, so we comply with the 60 spaces. Okay. So before you continue, the, the plan you're referencing you is the microphone. microphone. I'm sorry. The plan we're referencing is not on file with the board. Maybe it's now a good time to identify it, and we could just mark it as A1 with today's date. If you can give us a title of that, um, 
Sure. That colored aerial. It's entitled Wolf, Wolf Campus for Senior Living Office Building. Um, it's this entitled Site Plan Exhibit, and it's dated 9-17-2017. It is basically our site plan with the landscaping plan added in uh, over an aerial of where the assisted living facility is over to the nursing home and also what's existing on the site today. Thank you, Bill. So, sorry, please continue. Do you want me to mark this as an exhibit? Yeah, please. Uh, we should mark it as A1, Council? Yes. A1? Mm -hmm. Um, that's pretty much what our proposal is, along with the addition that's coming, the uh, future addition off to the side, which is about another 5,000 square feet. Um, with that, the same thing, what we had before, utilities will be accessed. There's, it runs through the middle of the site for water gas. Sanitary is going to run in the same direction where the existing uh, sanitary runs behind the uh, senior living complex. And just like we did before, we're going to amend the, the existing detention basin to help offset the uh, additional impervious coverage. The intent is to comply with all design standards that apply lighting, um, stormwater management, yes. and the like. Yeah, we have our county permit. We have our soil erosion permit. Uh, we have approval from the DRCC. Once we get our municipal approval, we could finalize that. And we also have our stormwater discharge permit. So we're pretty far along. From an engineering standpoint, is the proposal um, any more of an impact or, or let's say, um, creating any more problems than that which this board previously approved with the prior office building structure on this same lot? Uh, no, and again, we modified the building to be a little bit more residential in character, and it has residential character um, <coughs> around all four sides. It, it, it looks like almost like any kind of residential building, or like uh, we also stated a clubhouse. A and with the orientation of the building, we now have access out the side that leads directly to the parking lot um, and the sidewalk that leads right to the assisted living complex. Um, it, it's a little bit more of a streamlined design because before we used to have the parking across the, dri or the driveway, so it was a little bit more impervious coverage. Uh, the building footprint was a little bigger because it was a one story. Uh, so this, this is kind of like a little bit more compact and I think a little bit more aesthetically pleasing as far as a building. Well, which gets to my, my last point, Bill, before we um, turn you over to more questions of the board and their consultants and ultimately the public. If you would, um, maybe that color rendering of the elevation would be good for the board to see. Um, you know, the board members should know that that <laughs> we decided it would be a good opportunity for the applicant to. It's a little small, Bob. I know. Everything too small, <laughs> too small, too far away. We could actually pass. All right. This one's small to pass around if you like. But um, we had an opportunity to send out um, a neighbor meeting to our neighbors ahead of the public hearing. A few neighbors showed up, not many. But during that meeting, we presented our neighbors with this colored rendering, the same one, as to what you would be looking at if you were on our property or within sight of our property. This is what you would see under the proposed conditions. What I've been proffering to the board is residential characteristic, clubhouse looking, and what Bill's testified is more aesthetically pleasing. Um, you know, Bill, maybe that one is worth um, passing around to the board if, 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 you wouldn't, if you would like, Mr. Chairman, if that's not too um, big to handle and just pass, pass around pass the room. Do you mark it? Yes, we're going to mark it as well. So it's a color rendering elevation prepared by our site architect. A2, please. Thank you. Just so the board gets um, a feel of, of the color and the materials a little bit beyond the black and whites that were filed with the board. I have a question before you go any further. Um, the original building, how many square feet of floor space were on that one in that one-story building? It was 10,275 square feet. And how many uh, square feet of floor space do we have now? We have the building itself is, if you, the, the proposal right now is 12,000 square feet. Um, without, with taking out the elevator and, and stairwells and stuff like that, it gets a little bit down around a little over 8,000. But we also have a future addition for 5,500 square feet. And totally, uh, once I, like I said, once you take out stairwells and everything like that, it's about 14,000 square feet. So wait a minute, are you coming in for the building or are you coming in for the building and uh, an addition? That's a good question, Mr. Shepard. It, it's both, the entirety of the project. So when the campus reimagined putting a nicer looking structure on this lot where the office was approved, the campus said they don't want to come back to this board every year if they decide they need a little bit more room. The idea here is not growth for the campus. It's not any more services being provided, but it's to the extent that we think we can get more breathing room now, and it still appropriately fits on this lot, and we're not impacting coverages. We can fit the parking. It still looks wonderful, and it's not overbuilding. 
they want to propose it now. The reason it's called a future build is because it takes funding to get every square foot that we've got here. And right now, we know that we've captured that for the main part of the building. The secondary part of the building um, may come immediately, may come slightly after. But the vision and goal here is to build that entire product that you see there on Bill's plan. Okay, next question. Does this picture show both, excuse me, does this picture show both the, um, uh, the, the building you want to build now and the addition, or does it just show the building you want to build now? That just shows the building that's going to be constructed now. <laughs> so do we have another picture of the building with the addition so that we know what we're approving or not? Building looks nice. It does. Yeah, I believe the filed architecture will show the whole product. Uh, this is the A3 sheet that's in the file okay. package. Yeah. And this shows the additional wing that's attached to that, that building that's been passed around. And the intent, Bill, is for it to match in appearance, look, character, as to the, the original principal structure that we're proposing here. Is that right? Yes. If you look at the top elevation, you could tell it's, it's just carried across with the same architectural facade. So it's shown in that upper right hand elevation, is that correct? I'm behind you just saying so you know. Yes. <laughs> okay. Where it says where it says in parentheses future. That's Yes. Okay. Basically, you're looking for um, more square footage this time around than you did with the original application. On the net, there's a couple of thousand square feet more, absolutely, yes. Do you anticipate any more? square feet more. Do you anticipate any more employees? No, we do not. So this is basically storage space and... There's, there's a lot of storage space. Be requirements, we were actually just discussing this. It used to be a seven-year record retention. Now it's up to a decade. Um, folks live longer, thankfully. Um, documents, you know, pile up higher. It's still sort of a paper world in, in this business. Um, yeah, it, it, it's more space. I mean, it, the applicant would be remiss if they weren't um, smart enough with the right foresight to think that they don't want to have to come back every time they need to build a few more square feet. Um, so they... You know, um, enlisted their architect and engineer to decide what could properly fit here, what might look right, and this is it. And the only reason it is being called a future box connected to the original is because, again, it, it, it might be difficult to fund it now, but the idea and smart building growth future is building here too. the principal oh, building yeah. is built in such a way where it can be added onto as, as necessary in the future. So How many employees uh, are we talking about? Uh, you know, our planner can give you that testimony, the number of employees, because campus-wide, a lot of personnel are going to be coming into this building. Uh, we also have some folks who tend to be on the road who are personnel in the hospice portion of our care. So, you know, you can, you can think of them sort of akin to um, almost like a traveling salesman or maybe an estimator who their work is done as much in the field as it is back at the office. So you have some folks who aren't even in their office desk. I mean, these people day. are going to feel like they're getting out of prison because if they're all employees are in your space now and you're adding what? How many? 12,000 square feet? 12, it's, there are copiers in hallways right now. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a very good setup right now. You've got employees going through resident areas now when residents are trying to congregate, have chapel services, and you've got employees going through there trying to do functions, sometimes with hand trucks and things like that, moving equipment around and papers. So right now, it's, um, there's, there's not as much respect for people's personal space and privacy as the campus would like there to be. So... It looks like an ambitious build, but it really is just sort of a reaction to how tight things have gotten over the years. You've, okay. 
you've reviewed the uh, comments from our uh, engineer, yes? I haven't seen a review letter other than from back in, I believe it was May or June. June. Yes. June. Yeah. yeah. And you don't have any problem with any of the review no, comments? No, no, no. If that's the letter referring to, yes, we're okay with that. Now, um, we, we, you said that you needed um, 11 more parking spaces. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe but previously we were approved for 49 spaces, and this plan has 60. Okay. Now, does the 60 spaces relate to the... 12,000 square foot building you're going to build, or does it take into account 12,000 square foot building and the possible two story addition? It takes into everything, including the two story addition. Right. And, and how are the people parking there now? I mean, uh, there's, if, I mean, if you've been out to the campus, uh, there's the 40 spaces that are just to the west of the Siciling facility, and then they're also parking pretty much down the driveway. But you're still going to have those 40 spaces, right? Correct. They're staying, yes. And, and then we'll be able to eliminate everybody parking along the drive aisle that can pull into the parking lot. And maybe expand that a little more, Bill, because this is another difficulty we have on campus right now. Folks are sort of catching spaces as they can along the drive aisle on, on what we call Levinson Boulevard as you come in and around the Stein Assisted Living Building. Um, and, and while it, it kind of works, it's... It doesn't look good, and it's, it's kind of, it's tight, yeah. it's tight. So if, if you could just maybe show the board, Bill, maybe with, you drag your finger along the line where folks tend to park now, which we're hoping to alleviate with our new spaces. Yeah, the, the driveway that leads off of Levinson Boulevard towards the assisted living facility, after the bend in the driveway, um, right after that bend, all the way down to where pretty much the canopy is along the southern side of that driveway, they're pretty much parked along there. And at any one time, there's 12, 13, 14 cars parked there. And, and the stressful reality that that, that, that is, is you get folks visiting their family on a busy day, a holiday or something, and there's nowhere to park on top of visiting your ailing relative, it, it's not a very pleasant scenario to be short on parking and to be in, as you said, that very tight drive aisle. So the 60 spaces, while well, it sounds like a lot, and, and it is, um, it's an ambitious metric under the code, right? One space per every 250 square feet of area for, for office building. Um, we think it makes sense to build it. I have a question over here. Hey, um, the geometry plan shows a proposed future parking if drop-off area is not constructed. Um, and I noticed there's not an alternative landscaping plan. Yeah, currently our proposal is to install the drop-off area. Um, if during construction they decide that they don't need that and they could add a few more parking spaces, but our intent right now is to is to install the drop-off area. Okay, but if you don't, you're going to need to modify the landscaping Correct. plan. Correct. All right, so you're going to revise the landscaping plan to show an alternate scenario? Yeah, we could provide that. Was the generator part of the previous approval? Um, I believe there was a generator that was uh, part of the application just because of what the services needed to be, you know, in case the power went down that was going to be needed. Okay. But I'm pretty sure it was shown on the plan because I know we had a transformer generator. Everything was, was was the same setup as we have now. And does that have a sound enclosure? Yes. Okay. And then that's a good thought. And just to confirm, Bill, the, the intent is that the applicant will comply with all Municipal and state requirements under Title V for noise. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. No requirement if it's an emergency. If it's under gener if you're under emergency power, yeah. there's no requirement, right? But when, it, when it's so good to have the enclosure. Yeah. Is testimony completed? For, from our end, it is, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions then from the board? Uh, you said you had two witnesses, right? I think we'll yes, wait af until after the second one and we'll open to the public. Very good. That. All right. Certainly makes sense. Thank you, Bill. 
So at this time, Mr. Chairman, our second and final witness, our planner, Paul Rieke. Tell me swear or affirm to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Can you spell your last name for the record? It's R-I-C-C-I. -C -C -I. Paul, briefly, can you please provide the board with the benefit of your background and professional experience in the field of professional planning? Yes, I'm a licensed professional planner. I've been licensed since the year 2000. I'm also a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Um, I currently operate as a sole practitioner, uh, Ricky Planning LLC. I, I represent uh, five municipalities. I provide consulting planning services. It's okay. We can move forward. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You, Mr. Chairman. Well, before you, you begin your discussion, I know you're familiar with the LEAF, but to, just to confirm a few baseline things for the record, um, you're familiar with the campus, the area, the code, township master plan, is that correct? Th that is correct. You reviewed the plans that have been filed in connection with this project, is that correct? I have. And the approving documents from the prior 2013 zoning board approval that we've been discussing, is that correct? I have. And you're certainly familiar with the relief that's being sought this evening? Yes. So if you would take the board through the benefit of your analysis and conclusions from a planning perspective as to the, the suitability of what we're proposing um, on this amended application. First, I just wanted to summarize some of the findings of fact from the, the 2013 resolution, if I may. Um, on May 10th, 2013, the board approved a, a D1 use variance to permit the office function here in your R20 zone. Uh, at that time, uh, an impervious coverage variance was granted to permit 33.2% where 25.4% was existing. Um, also, you permitted a parking variance to permit 103 spaces where 114 are required. And as part of that previous approval, you found the application to be in inherently beneficial for a use that promotes the, the general good or the general welfare of the community. Um, you also found that the site was particularly well suited for the use. Um, Specifically, you found that um, due to the size of the property and the benefit of additional office space for workers to support elderly care uh, worked in, 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 the, in the previous scenario. And, and largely from a planning perspective, these conditions remain unchanged. What we're talking about is really an application of, of betterment. There's a small increase in, in office space being proposed that's being mitigated by the additional uh, parking here. Um, as you heard from the, the site engineer, um, um, the variance for the parking is associated with the existing non-conforming condition for the, for the senior building itself. The office building will fully be compliant with your, with, with your office, off-street parking standards for office, one space for 250 square feet. So we're not e exacerbating an off-street parking variance. Uh, and, and we think it, it, it makes sense. Um, in this context, to have the, the parking field in this context, to, to get those cars off of those access driveways, which provides an improved safety to the site, allows better flow of traffic through the site, and as well as emergency vehicles to, to, to travel throughout the site as well. Um, in, in terms of the variances, uh, again, we're seeking the, the amended uh, D1 variance for the additional, I believe the, the total square footage now is an additional 7,500 plus or minus uh, can you put footage? the mic up to your mouth so that the recording secretary can hear what you're saying? I apologize, Thanks. yes. Um, to just to repeat, we're seeking an amended D1 variance to have an additional approximate 7,500 square foot uh, of office space. In this context, the impervious coverage variance that was previously granted would be diminished. While the standard is maximum of 25%, we're 25.4% is existing today. The previous approval was for 33.2%, where today 31.7% is proposed. That's due, instead of there being a one-story building, now we have a two-story building and a more compact design a, as part of the, the revision here. So, so the, the impervious coverage goes from 33% to 31% with the new plan? And does that 31% take into account the um, the building that is uh, may be constructed later? Let me verify with the site engineer, but my understanding is yes, yes. So I guess the 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 footprint for was it the was the footprint for the older building 
uh, the uh, the original 10,000 square foot building was that a bigger footprint than we have now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. And it was actually one of my first questions. How are we adding space but decreasing the impervious coverage? And it's largely because there's a more compact design, a two-story building, and some walkways and the like, as, as explained to me, were, were consolidated as well. Um, we're also seeking a variance to permit 117 spaces where 140 are required, where 103 spaces were approved, where 114 were previously uh, required. And, and as I mentioned, again, uh, the shortfall, the 23 space shortfall is associated as a pre existing condition from the senior building. Um, the proposed office building, the spaces being added would be fully compliant with your, with your uh, parking requirements. Um, as the board is aware, I was going to provide a, a, just a, a, a limited amount of, of, of testimony associated with, with the use variance. As this board is aware, uh, associated with an inherently beneficial use application, it automatically meets the, the positive criteria as the use promotes the general welfare. Um, as you previously heard testimony several years back for applications such as this, um, the court suggests that you rely on the SICA four-part balancing test. And that's a test that asks the board to balance the benefits of an application versus the detriments. And, and what we've largely heard here today from the applicant is that there's, there, there's very minor changes occurring. These are changes that are, are centralized to the site. We're reducing impervious surface. While we're adding office space, we're increasing the amount of, of parking. So there's no fundamental changes that, that are occurring here. Um, with, with that said, the four-part balancing test asks, the, the first part is to identify the, the public interest at, at stake. And, and clearly, assisted living facilities of congregate care, housing provide an important housing and, and health care need in the community. And associated with that, the, 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 uh, the office and back office operations continue to be inherently beneficial in accordance with the, the Princeton case as well. Interestingly, I, I did review your master plan and um, your 2016 master plan indicated that um, over 50% of your population increase uh, in 2010 uh, occurred in two age cohorts, the, the 55 to 64 cohort, as well as the 65 and over cohort. So it, it shows me as a planner that you're aging as a population. So clearly the need for this facility continues to grow over time. Uh, as well, and also I just wanted to mention that this application also meets Purpose L to encourage senior citizen housing construction as well. In Purpose L, I mean of the purpose of the Act, Section 4055D2 of the Municipal Land Use Law. And regarding any detrimental uh, impacts associated with this application, um, from a planning perspective, I largely opined on this already. There, there are no substantial changes occurring. This is a uh, development that, that's centralized in a, in a portion of the site. It's currently a grass field, so there's limited, if any, trees being being uh, removed as part of this application. You saw on our exhibit that, um, and, 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 and our plans that were submitted, that additional supplemental landscaping is also being added uh, to the perimeter of the site that um, is largely filling in any existing voids of, of, of trees that, that have died or if there's any maybe gaps in, in, the, in the perimeter buffer that exists today. And, and as you can see on, on the aerial, I, I assume that's exhibit A1, you can see that there is a, a, a substantial planted perimeter buffer in this track. And uh, from a planning perspective, um, for lack of a better word, it does not get much better in terms of a, of a perimeter buffer. Um, there's going to be no increase in employees as a result of this application. And this application in no way will impact your uh, your standards of performance in terms of uh, noise, glare, heat, pollution, and the like. There's no substantial changes occurring here. So from a, from a planning st standpoint, there's no new substantial negative impacts being proposed as part of this application. And, and really, again, it's an application of betterment. Here we have a substantially improved design. The application looked, the applicant looked at the, at the building over time and has designed um, a building that we believe is is more attractive, has additional architectural embellishments and features that would be an asset uh, uh, to this site. Um, make sure I'm not missing anything. So how many employees uh, total you said he would answer the question? It, it, it was explained to me by the applicant that there's approximately 130 employees and, and they're looking to move 
uh, finance, HR, hospice, and, and IT. And if you see on the floor plan, there's also a large like general purpose room that they can utilize as needed for, for various events. Um, that, so that kind of asked the question, well, what's, what's that going to replace in the existing uh, building? And there will be more space available for uh, recreation, physical therapy. You heard about the record keeping needs. Um, there's also copy machines in hallways and the like. They've, they've outgrown uh, the facility, so they need additional space. That's hence why. With, with all the parking there. spaces that you're adding, does that mean currently now you're like deficient in spaces? Um, as explained already, um, there, there are um, people are parking along the, the access drives. And with, with any facility, uh, there's going to be high points and low points of parking when guests visit and the like. So currently under normal operating procedures, people are parking on the access drives. We, we don't find that to be uh, conducive to a facility like this where if emergency per personnel, emergency service vehicles had to get in locations, so we want to get those cars it better, off those obviously. access drives. And it's, it's the parking as being proposed is, is centralized in the site. Um, there's existing tall pines along the, the northerly portion of the parking lot, and there's understory plantings proposed. So it's, it's not going to be visible, and we're still decreasing the impervious curve coverage since the approval. So we think it's a really a win-win scenario in this context. Well, what are the what are the hospice people going to be doing in this building? I can't. I don't have that level of detail, sir. Oh, it's well, there's, there's office um, information. So it's an, they're going to be doing function. an office function. It's, it's their office space. And Bob, this is when I was describing um, their function as, as oh. sometimes akin to off-site workers who they travel around. But yeah. this is this is their home oh, office. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not a treatment <laughs> area. If that's where. If, if well, that's, that's kind of where I was going. going right. No. But all I wanted you to do was say that they're going to be using it for office space, and they're not going to be using it for treatment. And I would have been satisfied. Yes, that's that's correct. Right. I'm sorry. Um, the the third part of the, the criteria asks whether there are any um, whether we can mitigate any negative impacts, and, and no negative impacts uh, have been identified to date. That's something that the applicant will, you know, consider as as, as the board votes, uh, you know, firmly on, on the application. And the the fourth part of the test asks us to balance the benefits of the application uh, versus the detriments. Again, the positives here being. Uh, great and the need for a facility such as this and the continued use of facility such as this and for it to maintain vibrant active and, and be conducive to its residents outweigh the detriments were which are really uh, minimal if any based upon the the, the previous approval so in, in my opinion this application clearly meets the, the sick of four part balancing tests uh, re regarding the bulk variances um, again we're focusing on the negative criteria in, in the polling case, it's, it's very clear that the board should evaluate the, the benefits of, a, of the entire proposal. Uh, in my opinion, this application uh, nonetheless meets at least uh, five uh, criteria, the municipal land use law, because it's inherently beneficial, it promotes the general welfare. Because um, we're reducing impervious surface, we, it's conducive to providing additional light, air, and open space, which is purpose C. Um, the more attractive building promotes purpose I, a desirable visual environment. Uh, purpose L is to encourage uh, senior citizen uh, community housing construction. And M um, is we are proposing a more compact form of development, which also meets purpose M. Um, so while the positives are, are clearly strong, the negatives are strong as well. Regarding the negative impacts uh, in terms of the, the variance relief, while we are technically seeking an impervious coverage variance, we are decreasing the extent of the variance from the previous approval. So that's clearly consistent with the intent of zoning. And also regarding the parking, while there is a variance, um, that parking is largely, as I mentioned, an existing non-conforming condition associated with the senior portion of the building. We're supplementing and meeting our office parking requirement that we're proposing to construct in accordance with your ordinance requirements. So for those reasons, we, it's my opinion, that this application uh, is a good application and one that, that meets the burden of proof for, for variance relief. Okay, any questions? Uh, just, uh, you say you have a permit from um, Somerset County 
for the uh, driveway at uh, DeMott? Yeah, uh, did they look at that? Uh, yes, we received the Somerset County approval. Okay, they've looked at that. All yes. Right. Other questions? I have a question, but it's not it's not for Paul. Um, in Mark's letter, it says the previous resolution agreed that the office would not be leased or sold as a standalone building <coughs> in whole or in parts. Does the applicant intend to continue with that condition? Anything else before we open to the public? Okay. One, just one question. Um, and, and excuse me if this has been explained before, but just to sum it up, um, it's been explained that this is for existing employees and the prior approval was for about 10, 11,000 square feet with 31 additional spaces. This is for about altogether about 14 and change and 60 spaces. Um, what decision went into those? Into, what was the decision? Why is there a little bit more building space and more parking this time around? You want to use the mic? Yeah. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> There's not much time left for me to do it much more tonight, though. So only two or three more times, I promise. <laughs> do you want to explain at all the, the the genesis that went into that? I mean, I, I can call another witness, Mark, um, our director of um, you know facilities from the campus, to explain what may have gone into that to the extent he was involved with those discussions. But I've been representing the campus for for four years, and and I can tell you that since prior to the last application. And I can tell you that the applicant is um, is not big on land development. They're not in the business of developing properties, right? They run a senior living facility campus. And when they decided to go to an alternative design, the architect landed on a size that he worked in conjunction with Bill Lane from an engineering standpoint, and they landed on the size they did. It wasn't um, for a projection of future growth. It wasn't for a projection of future need. But it was a projection of this looks great. We think we can probably fund this. Um, even though it's going to be a lot more expensive than the old modular building would be. And let's buffer in a little bit, you know, let's put an extra notch in the belt just in case we feel the need that our storage is growing, we have more copiers, we've got two or three more employees, because the reality is th there might be a few more employees. There's no new services coming in, but over time you might have the need for a few more people, and they landed on the building they did, and a lot of the size is the articulation of the building. If you look at it, it's a pretty sharply designed building, the parking we landed on was really to comply with code, right? So, like I said, I think it's an ambitious metric for the office standard, but the campus embraced it because right now we've got mayhem out there on Levinson Boulevard, people just taking any space they want. Ambulances do need to access this site. It could be a problem. And come a holiday or, or you know, Mother's Day, something like that, it's really tough for people visiting their folks to find a good space. And by the time you do, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's mentally taxing. So, so you, there wouldn't be, now you say they've got 130 employees now. If we limited the employees to 140 uh, as part of this uh, uh, variance application, that would be okay? You know what? I don't know what that really does, in, in all honesty, Bob, because if you limit the, I think you can limit us and say we're not going to have secondary users leasing or taking over this building. We're not going to sell this building. Uh, we're not going to subdivide it out to a new user. Then you would have sort of, possibly conflicting uses on, on a single campus, right? That might have more trip generation, might have different hours of operation for different folks. It's for our campus, it's for our people. If our campus grows, that means we're probably doing something right for the community. Um, the building's not growing. If the building grows, we're coming back to this board anyway. I think that's sort of the self-policing measure. So I'm not sure how limiting the employees really does anything but put um, a, a sort of an onerous limitation on the applicant that really has no nexus to how much activity is really happening here. I, I think a more effective restriction is to keep it that it has to be employees of the campus. And, and that's, you know, that is the use variance. The use variance is that they're seeking an office building to house the employees for this use, which happens to be inherently beneficial. They're not asking for an office building in, in a residential zone. So, you know, for some other, to lease it out to some other office user, that's not their application and be an entirely different application before this board. So I think that's a, in, uh, 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 a totally uh, appropriate condition and I think effective condition to uh, address these situations we're talking about. Thanks, Mark. Other questions? Okay, we'll open to the public then. Is there anyone who wants to ask 
any of the witnesses questions concerning their testimony or make a statement concerning the application. Since you may be making a statement, we need to swear you in, and we need you to start with your name and address after that. Wait, let's Please, make sure the mic is working. Hello? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay, sir, let me swear you in. If you raise your right hand and solemnly swear affirm to tell the whole truth. Yes. Okay. And your name again? My name is Chris Williams. I live at 20 Magnolia Road. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, as far as the location of the parking lot versus the building, I mean, we have a residential area on the upper half. I don't know. I think that's the north side of the campus. Why, why did you decide to put the parking on that side when you could have put it on the south side of the campus and closer to the detention basins, reducing your drainage costs? That's just the, how we laid it out. I mean, it's centralized between the existing parking lot and the parking lot that we're proposing and how it lines up with the assisted living facility. Um, it, it, whether we flip it or not, it's not going to change the amount of uh, drainage that we need. It's it's all relative, but yeah. we we looked at it and thought this was the best layout uh, for this, the location of the building along with the parking layout. Because it just what concerns me is lighting. I live right next to your parking lot now. You, the lighting has been re you reduce the lighting at night, which is nice. The, they're not going to leave lights on in a building. We're not going to be able to see the lights from coming off the building. You're not going to be spotlights out there for people to walk around and stuff. Is that correct? Is this, you said it was from a nine to five building. Microphone. I'm sorry. They took up then <laughs> you can't talk anymore, Larry. Yeah. That's why they <laughs> took him. I couldn't possibly help anymore. They took him from me. It's an office building, so it's 9 to 5, typical work hours, work days. And to the extent there are any lights on a building after hours, it's security doors. It's a man door. might have a light over it, just like a sconce you would at your okay. house kind of a thing. They, they um, do have a, a total of six parking lot lights. Um, they're your typical yeah. shoebox fixture, 20 feet in height, and they're all on the uh, – well, except – with the exception of one that's along the driveway, five of them are on the other side of that um, hedgerow around okay. the parking lot. There's none on the parking lot that's closer to the residential. Okay. Okay, anyone else? My name is Rob Belbeers. I'm at 16 Magnolia. Okay, sir. So me swear to tell the whole truth? I do. All right. First of all, is 55 a Corhort? Corhort? Is that what I heard earlier? <laughs> I'm turning 55 this year, so I'm... <laughs> well, the, the U.S. Census um, has a range of, of population groups, right? right. And, and, one, and, the, and what I was mentioning is that two age cohorts, and let me get the... Cohorts. And that's... that's that's for a range of population from 55 to 64. I'm just kidding. That's okay. It's, okay. A, sta it's a standard <laughs> demographic term. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you. Uh, just to orient everybody from where my property and my wife's property is, we're at the top of the uh, picture, right in the middle. And where that parking lot is, we're on the left side of that parking lot, right above that, where there's kind of an open space. Trees have fallen down. But I do want to give credit to these folks. Um, two years ago when we had the uh, public hearing, uh, myself and our neighbor Linda requested a fence, an eight-foot fence, uh, for a one-story building at that time, and they complied. So, you know, credit to them, and uh, they came through, and we appreciate that. A month ago, they invited us to their uh, meeting to, to, sh um, to give us a, a, an overview of what they proposed to do, um, using the word neighbor-friendly, which we appreciate that also. I guess, I guess the question I have for you is, does any, do any of you live on the back of a commercial property or a property that is not a neighborhood? So if you, if you did, it kind of changes the landscape of where you live. And certainly, a lot of these folks can see this property. I mean, you know, 
they, they do well, and I'm not, but, but as we look at the value of our property, and, and there is a buffer, and I, I think it was brought up, there's a buffer. Um, I think Monica last time said Superstorm Sandy certainly did a number on it, I'm sure, for your properties. So, so that buffer is deteriorating. And we're looking at it going, well, how do we maintain that buffer? Or how can they maintain that buffer so that our property values remain at, at least where they should be? So when we were talking last time, some of the things that I said was, their parking lot that's at the top of the property, I guess north, as, as Chris was talking about, in that road, our house is, the back of the house is the property, and then they're right there. So, so, I, so we're going, can you eliminate that parking lot? Can you eliminate that road and in, increase the buffer for us? Trees, whatever it is. And when we agreed to the fence, it was a one-story building. Now the line of sight has changed. Now we can look into the backyard, they can look into the back of our houses. So I think things need to be considered, whether it's trees, whether it's a, a berm, um, whether it's re moving the parking lot to another spot, whether it's even moving the road away for these folks. As you know, some, I know economics, I know things cost money, but if you're going to be a friendly neighbor, you need to consider some of these alternatives. Just out of curiosity, since you went to that meeting, did you raise that with yes, them I at did. that time? Yes, I did. And? Um, they took it into consideration and listened. I, no response to it at that time. So, I only got one word out that time before <laughs> I got the mic. We heard our neighbors and we discussed it um, at the meeting, after the meeting. Um, the parking lots are not moving. That would completely um, monkey wrench campus operations. That, that's not part of the proposal, nor would it mitigate anything about what we're doing here tonight with this office building. This building's over 300 feet from the property line. It looks far more residential than the box, the utility box that we were proposing last time, which, like I said, was functional, worked, and was well within the belly of our campus that it was not an impact to any of our adjoining lot owners. It's a two-story structure now, like a house, typical house, complies with the height, looks better, um, has typical roof and peaks lines of a house, a few hundred feet, over 300 from the property line. We did discuss, notwithstanding the fact that it might be overkill, um, you heard Paul Riki testify that it doesn't get much better than this as far as buffering going. Well, we, as we, I, we, he indicated that there's been a deterioration of the buffer. Is that I haven't been there, but is that true? Not a planted buffer, not planted buffer deterioration where we've planted pursuant to old site plans and it's died since then. Um, some of the trees in the woods may have fallen or died over time. They have. They so have. with that, I mean, we can't replant a 70-foot oak in the, in the middle of the woods. Um, we can add more perimeter screening. Like I said, it might be overkill, but we're trying to be good neighbors, and that was the whole point of our meeting. Perimeter screening um, is something we could add more of. I don't know. I think it's redundant probably with an eight-foot fence. I'm not sure what you would plant. That would really get you much more than that at first planting. I mean, you really can't go more than 12 feet, 14 feet at planting, I don't think, um, without buying you know, a Rockefeller center size tree. Um, so I'm really not sure what you do. We, we think we're far enough from the property line. You've got the eight-foot fence. The building you're looking at is a house-looking office building that's only occupied during daytime hours when most folks are at the office anyway. Um, and, and lighting's going to comply. Go ahead, Paul. I wanted to say one thing, too, just, just to keep in perspective. Hold the, mic. Put the yeah. microphone in yes. your mouth. Yes. Um, speaking to Exhibit A1, just so the board is, is fully aware, um, sir, can you show your property? Right there, right there, right? Okay. Yeah. And there's an eight-foot fence here, right? Yes. Then the parking lot. That covers two okay. properties. North is generally straight up. Between your property and where the building is proposed, is there is there a row of a trees. mature yeah. pine trees? Yes. And those are mature trees, correct? Correct. And so there is a mature row of trees also in the internal portion of the property that's also breaking the line of sight to this proposed building as well. And, and that's as why- As long as they stay up. Yeah, they're, they're, you know. they're, they're proposed to stay. And, and, no, no, and no, as long as they stay up, i.e. weather or i.e. any type of um, disease. So it, what you're talking is about an organic tree, right? You're not talking about a, a cement fence on a highway. Organic tree can fall down tomorrow, correct? Um, so, so what we're looking at yeah. is more of a buffer in between our property and your property to ensure that the line of sight to the building. We're not, listen, I understand. Well, you're saying on the property line you're yeah, suggesting? And even if, even if half of that parking lot has to come off, because another t intangible is commercial traffic. They have deliveries in the morning. Well, as they come down the road, they go in, uh, right in front of that parking lot to the left, right by Chris's property, and around the back. 
So that's seven in the morning. I'm not sure, you know. So that's, you know, that's commercial traffic that, you know, can be heard. So my, my question would be to you, sir. If your trees that are located here and those could fall, how is that different than the trees that are here that could fall? Well, I don't know, maybe about 10 or 15 or, or 20 versus just one row. As you, look at look at the, the property to the left. Because in terms of a line of sight, by having the trees closer to the building, it's going to block that visibility of that building better than on the property line. That's that's my right, right. But look at this, the, the, Monica and Tom, they all live up in this end right here. And there's a pretty decent row that ha okay. a lot of has fallen down. Okay? okay, so you're concerned that the buffer is not as wide. Well, look at, yeah, exactly. Okay. It, it, that's why I say if you can eliminate this, the buffer increases, gives us more privacy, gives you more privacy. Don't you want, you guys probably want privacy, well, look, I, I, what, for, right? What, 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 uh, what we're talking about eliminating now has been there for 20 years. It's been there since 1999. It has never been an issue. Our neighbors have the email addresses and phone contacts of our top executives at the campus. We rarely hear from them. We hear from them when we file an application for development, and we discuss concerns that have been ongoing. Not big enough concerns that they raised it in between all of our applications, but we hear it now, and that's fine. I respect that. We're okay with some perimeter buffering. I think it doesn't make much sense, given our distance to the houses, given what's already there, and given the eight-foot fences that are there, but we're up for it. We're okay with working with Mr. Healy, who represents the township and has the township's interest in mind to work with Bill Lane on his landscaping plan. We can reposition some. We're showing a lot of landscaping on the proposal, considering what we're building especially. We can work with Mark's office as to repositioning some of that landscaping material, maybe supplementing it, but we're not redeveloping a different lot on the campus for Stein-assisted living for a parking lot that's been there for 20 years just because we filed an application for an interior. I mean, that's really not a, a fair exchange or yeah, discussion that's parking. on the table at all. I, I disagree with you. You're, well, you're, you're adding the, more parking. The, to the, the application before this board is not for the parking lot that exists. It's for the parking lot and the building that they're adding. Okay. So what this board needs to do is look at the impacts that are going to result from that new parking lot okay. and from that new building. I see a site plan that has... 35 foot high building so it's basically the height of a regular house it's a little it's larger than a regular house but it will have the it'll have the height it'll look like a long house right um, it there is a, a stand of very tall mature last time I was there looked pretty healthy evergreen trees 300 feet of distance between the homes between those homes and this 35 foot tall you've been structure. in our backyard I've been in on this. I've not been, of course. I've well, been you in should your come backyard. to our backyard first before you answer that or you I, make I've that never, comment. Of course, I haven't been in your backyard, well, but I've been on this site. Then. I've been on this site a number of times. I've been in this exact parking lot. I've observed the eight-foot high fence that they put in place. I think some additional measures that they could add. I don't see why they can't add an additional uh, row or two of evergreen trees between the eight-foot tall fence and that parking lot. Then at least there's some insurance policy if that hedgerow that's there becomes unhealthy, then at least there's a second hedgerow mm -hmm. to, to block the residents. I can see you, you've added uh, some undergrowth on the north side of the, of the proposed parking lot because there is some, the canopy of the, of the pines are kind of growing up, so you're proposing some, some shrubs underneath there to fill that gap. Put it also on the other side, so again, you have kind of have them on both sides. Um, beyond that, that's about as comprehensive of a, as a, of a screening plan, frankly, that I've ever seen uh, for a building that's 35 feet in height and 300 feet. I mean, this is multiple rows of... of this is residential property, right? Sir, this is we, not commercial this, property. This, 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 board, residential. this board has seen multiple applications similar to this. Uh, Almost every single other, every other month, they're seeing a place of worship or a school or something of that nature where it's surrounded, and one of their main goals is to try to protect the residents around it. They okay. do this on a monthly basis. Good. So, uh, it's, and I, again, in my opinion, if you add the things that I, that I just suggested, I don't know what more else they can do to address the impacts of what they're actually proposing. I, I explained it, but I guess you didn't hear it. So I does, heard it. Does your client have any problem with the... Uh, what Mark has described, we can incorporate that in the uh, in the resolution of approval. Oh, we certainly can, absolutely. Anyone else wish to speak?
uh, Thomas Mager, 12 Magnolia Road. It's into the mic. Uh, Is that better? We need to yeah. swear. Yeah. Close, yeah. Yes, sir, you solemnly swear from tell the whole truth? Yes. Um, just a comment regarding the spaces, going from 30 spaces to 60 or whatever the number is. Um, I'm against that for the reasons that our backyards are flooding on a regular basis. And I, I just want to make a, a comment that I'm against the, the increase. I don't understand why we have to have increased parking spaces when there's already dedicated spaces in the other building and there's not going to be any additional workers. So just a comment. Um, can anybody tell me what the process is if uh, the owner of the building, whether it be now or in the future, wants to change the purpose of that property? In other words, if they want to change and have additional pa uh, patients in there, what's the process of, of, cha of changing that uh, purpose? You mean the purpose of the, the, the purpose of the building? The function of the building, yes. They would have to come back to, to us to do that because the resolution we're going to pass is going to limit the use of that building to an office building that will be open uh, during daytime hours. So that that's a that would be a big change, and they'd have to come back to do that. Okay. Um, what what controls will there be for the nighttime lighting for this building? We hear that there's going to be perimeter lighting. Um, there's obviously going to be a parking lot, a new parking lot with additional parking spaces and parking lights. Well, we just had someone testify, I think it was the planner, that um, at, that the building would be used between 9 and 5, and that um, after the, uh, the building was, um, people were out of the building for the evening, the only lights that would be on would be security lights. So that's also going to be part of the resolution. So the parking light lights will be off at that point? Well, it would park? seem to me that if the building is going to be used as an office building and the, um, and the, uh, the people will not be there at night, then it would seem to me to make sense that those lights would be turned off. Um, just a comment in regards to the, the picture that we're seeing right now. It, it appears to be a summertime picture where, where you're seeing a lot of trees and a lot of shrubs in blossom. They're, they're all nice and green and everything. But in the wintertime, when the headlights from the parking lot and the existing buildings come pointing at our house, they come <coughs> straight into our house. So just a comment in regards to what you're seeing now is not 12 months of the year. Right. What's being approved, though, is interior. <coughs> I think that what you are experiencing is an existing parking lot, and that's not being changed. That's not part of this approval. But, but the, we were talking about the environment, and we're talking about no, the impact. No, I understand that. But one of the, the, what's before this board <coughs> has to do with what they're about to build, and what they're about to build is interior, not it, not the uh, parking lot that is impacting your property. Right, but a lot of the comments, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of the comments that were made was that there was a lot of shrubbery and it couldn't get better than this. Let me tell you, all the trees that have fallen down, and in the winter when it doesn't get, when it can get better than that, we see all the lights, and it's, it's not as pleasing as it could be. That's where we're going to include, as part of this resolution, that they're going to put up uh, a, um, an, another buffer uh, comprised of um, eight-foot-tall uh, pine trees. Uh, they'll stay green all year round. And um, that all, any other landscaping that uh, Mr. Healy thinks is appropriate. Yep. We appreciate what your concern is. And that really does address um, the fact that some of these, the trees in the woods portion of the uh, property have, um, uh, have fallen down. <coughs> but there's like, again, the, what um, my uh, colleague has said is that the thing that's really a problem for you is something that's existed uh, for a long time. We're going to try and deal with that for you, but w we're not going to have them tear up an existing parking lot that's been there for 20 years. We're just going to try and prove the buffer. 
So the extra trees that are going to be uh, the double line of trees that you referenced, yes. uh, how many houses will that cover? Is it going to be just for the six-foot fence area, or will it be for other areas of the, of the neighborhood? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, that was uh, that was not really um, raised. As how far is the eight-foot fence? It just covers two houses, I believe. Well, that doesn't sound like it's going to solve the problem, though, does it? Correct. I think Mr. Healy will have some control over how long that um, uh, that double line of pine trees goes, so that um, people will get some uh, some protection and some uh, relief from the the problem that exists. Thank you. Hmm? Uh, this this issue was raised in the in the last application, and and there was concern raised at the public at that point that the trees in that existing buffer, uh, the natural area had been had fallen down. And as a condition of that approval, they had proposed uh, a total of 24, 24 evergreen trees kind of along the driveway here. And that then this plan has carried that forward. Mm -hmm. um, and then the suggestion I made a few minutes ago, and in, in addition, the other requirement was that eight foot high fence which they put in. The suggestion I made a few minutes ago would be to follow, basically do a similar thing here with, uh, I think it was seven or eight foot high evergreen trees and put it in between, to the, on the north side of this parking lot, between that parking lot on that fence. So you'd have, in addition to what's here, in addition to the distance, you'd have seven or eight foot high evergreen trees here, as they've already proposed, along the northerly side of this parking lot to supplement that fence. Again, you have the existing large uh, row of pines that would be supplemented again by low shrubs, evergreen shrubs on either side, which would help to block whatever, um, block the, the, the headlights. I, I, I can't imagine it'd have headlights this far away, but it, just to make sure, you'd have a double row on each side of that hedgerow of evergreen shrubs to block that. It's double and triple protected. Any other, anybody else wish to speak? My name is Linda Shepard. I'm at 18 Magnolia Road. Okay, and you saw me swear to tell the truth? I do. Um, basically, more comments uh, about the whole process that we've been going through as a neighborhood. Uh, I can backtrack 35 years ago that we all bought our houses because it was green acres and nothing was ever going to be built, but that was a long story, and there were tons of trees. Uh, as far as the fence in the backyard, um, we do have a fence. It took me three years to finally appropriate it to get the fence for only two of the houses. And it wasn't a very easy process because there was always changing of the guards or the person that I had to see. But we are very grateful that we have the fence but when the fence was put up, it was under the conditions that we were only going to have a one-story building. There is very little privacy in the backyard, and being neighborhood friendly, we did discuss a parking lot. Perhaps put it on the other side. Be neighborhood friendly. When you go look at the plans again, consider the people that are living on the block. You do hear the garbage cans, 6 o'clock in the morning, going down. You do hear every truck coming down. It's no longer a residential place. It's a place of business. The comment I'm also going to make is a concern, a couple, a teacher and me. I really don't like hearing that you have a building with a perhaps down the future. We're going to add to it. That to me is a can of worms ready to be open. I'm finding great difficulty figuring out that you're going to have that many parking spaces because you have a problem with not being able to accommodate what you have now. I also have a very big concern that, well, this building is going to be just for paperwork, but we're not going to have any additional personnel. Well, I don't know if you count part-time people or field people that are going to be going back and forth all the time. So neighborhood friendly, I love Somerset. I love where I live. I cannot see the value of the home going down totally, but it will go down. As far as the swamp area, the flooding, it's gotten really worse without the trees. And yes, we've had Sandy, and we have a few more hurricanes coming up, so it should be a great winter. Um, neighborhood friendly, 
I don't see it when you can go back to the drawing board. You can have heard all our requests at the time and figure out maybe there was a better location for a parking lot that we wouldn't have to have the lights, the sound, the dancing, the music, and the wonderful thing that you have like garbage men coming down waking you up. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? My name is Emery Sestak, and I'm representing Cedarbrook Drive. I'm on 33 Cedarbrook Drive. You saw me swear, affirm, tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. And just let me state for the record, you're not representing anybody. You can't do that. You're here, and I, I they're understand. here. They're welcome to talk, and if they're not, then... I, I understand. I was just the uh, first one from Cedarbrook Drive, and that's what I meant. You gave it a shot. Anyways, <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is my property right here. I, uh, I share a corner... And so a couple couple questions. Um, I know that um, we were talking about impervious codes and impervious, um, um, uh, I guess, areas. You know, so, so this, this large parking lot, the additional structure will um, prevent moisture and rainfall from going down into the ground. Um, I, didn't, I don't really understand the drainage system and how that's proposed. And the reason I ask is because there's some, uh, there's some holding reservoirs here in the corner of the property, and then there's a brook that runs along my property line, which, you know, the storm water drains that direction. So when there's a heavy rain, there's a lot of, a lot of water that goes there. So is, is the plan to have addition, um, all of the rainwater, I guess, that's collected either going into the, you know, into the Magnolia neighbor's property or, or, or where, where is it supposed to be diverted? That's, that's one of my questions that I have. So I'll let our engineer answer that. I mean, okay. I, I can tell you from a layman's perspective, it all has to be controlled pursuant to the township design standards, which right. it is, and it is reviewed by your township engineer, which it was and will be. Um, but to add some more um, expert color and testimony on it, we'll let Bill explain it to your satisfaction. Sure. Yeah, part of our part of our application also to the Delaware Raritan Canal Commission, because we have the stream in the back, mm. um, we also have to provide infiltration. So the building, there's a large infiltration bed, which was part of our original application also, um, off to the east of the building. So anything coming off the roof will get percolated back into the ground, so it won't actually be run off, per se, over land. Um, with that, because we are increasing the pervious coverage, and like Larry had said, we, we, it has to be controlled. So we are increasing the size of the detention basin uh, to help alleviate the additional impervious coverage and runoff. Okay, so the, yeah, that's that's the concern that I have is is the retention basin on the corner of the property. It pretty, it, you know, floods that brook pretty pretty decently on any time there's a heavy rain. In addition to that, with the additional um, parking lot and you know there's you know oil and gas and especially new asphalt down, that's going to cause additional pollution down my my direction. So that's just a concern that I have. Um, the other the other question is so, in terms of uh, the size of the building, it seems like there's, um, since there's no additional employees at the moment, it seems like, um, you know, the building is going to be a lot larger for, you know, storage space and things like that. But as I know, moving from, say, apartment to a house, if there's additional space, that space will be filled. So if, if there's an addition, if there's a larger building that's set up, it's more, more than likely that, you know, it's going to increase uh, the number of employees. And then, um, especially now, if somehow uh, the applicant is managing to conduct business and run business without the building there, with the additional building, it seems like there's going to be, you know, expansion. And so at what point will the expansion stop? Are we going to get to the point where that building might not be full enough and then there's going to be more parking on the street um, as it is today? So I don't know. I just I just feel like that, that you know, that size of building is is sort of an overkill. That's all I'm saying for that. Um, and then just another comment for the parking lot. I mean, I hear I hear the garbage trucks every like just about every morning because you know it all happens back here close to me. So I hear it all the time. It's not just the garbage truck. You're gonna have you know snowplow. Whenever there's a snowplow coming through, we hear the back and forth and back and forth. And they do it all all hours of the night. If the snow comes in the middle of the night, snowplows are back and forth and back and forth. And so. I just, I just think it's, I mean, I understand how it's necessary, you know, for conducting business. I, I enjoy real estate business myself. However, um, I think that it's just adding a level of 
you know, intensity to all aspects, to lighting pollution, to noise pollution, and to a number of other things. Um, you know, in the winter time, you know, we could see right through. You got the lies, lights blazing, and so there's just a, a lot of concern as to where is this going next. Um, how you know this application is is designed to obviously improve the area, but it seems like we're really you know jamming as much as possible into you know the space that's available, and and I'm not sure how much that um, I'm not sure how much that uh, kind of conforms to the way that this neighborhood is initially set up to have pockets of trees and to be more um, you know kind of neighborhood friendly I guess you can say that uh, because it's becoming more commercialized it's it's just more cement more buildings whereas you know we're seeing less and less trees and more you know more industrialization so uh, that's my comments I appreciate the explanation and uh, nothing further Okay, anyone else wish to speak? Uh, we don't usually have second opportunities, but is there anyone else? Okay. Um, it's Linda Shepard again. I realize you're all residential people. You all have homes. You appreciate your backyard and the value of your house. I do appreciate senior citizens. My mom is 91. So I understand the need for it. But there has to be some type of compromise. And what I'm asking the people on the board up here as you're looking this over and the future of Franklin and what's best for all, you need to come to Magnolia Road, Cedar Grove Road, actually go behind the backs of our homes and see what it's like from our perspective. Hear the garbage trucks and see the extra traffic that we are having on Magnolia Road, that the hole is actually, the holes in the road are a disgrace because everyone coming from the area is using Magnolia Road as a cut-through. And we do hear all the trucks all the time, so it's not neighborhood friendly. And yes, it's probably something very necessary, but we did have this conversation a very long time ago. And from a one story, now we go to a two story, which means it's higher yet, and you're invading the privacy of the property. But I really would appreciate if, while you're considering this, that you do actually go on Magnolia Road, Cedar Grove, go behind the homes, look at it as a business perspective, and also as a homeowner. Would you like this in your backyard? Or is there a better way that they can come up with a solution? I promise not to come uh, up again. I'm not Thank sure you. about the comparison you're making with Cedar Grove Lane. Well, I'm not familiar with the gentleman's that side, but from Magnolia Road, I know all my neighbors on the street. And it's, with a project like this, I think it would be advantageous if you come to our property and see what we're talking about firsthand. Because, yes, the pictures look nice with the trees, but you need to come and see it from our backyard. It has been a tremendous change. Thank you. The project is better. I'm having a hard time. It's, it's my fault. I don't understand what you're saying. What I'm saying is, Come to Magnolia Road, go on our property, and see in here what we see all the time, rather than just the blueprints. Or if you go down, when you go into their development, the trees look really nice on that side. You need to come see the other side. If you get the opportunity, that's all I'm asking. Thank you. When, when are your typical deliveries? Because I, I, I haven't heard delivery trucks and things like that being a problem from the last application. Maybe I'm just getting too old and missing all this. But isn't there a limit? You don't, you have, the, you have these things happening in the middle of the night? We don't, Mr. Chairman. The earliest that we do have is first thing in the morning, bread and milk deliveries come, right, which is typical. It's been that way since the 1940s, right? Um, aside from that, we try to manage it during daytime. Um, you know, our neighbors are very passionate. I get that, right? As a residential property owner, I don't want to be impacted unduly by neighbors, so I understand their concerns. But, but what baffles me a little bit is we don't hear from our neighbors until we come back to a hearing. If we did, we'd respond. We had our neighborhood meeting. One of our neighbors who's not here this evening said, you know what, I see a light from my house. It had nothing to do with the proposed building. I see a light from my house. We had that corrected within a day. Um, your landscapers came on a Sunday because it had rained all week before. They could only come on a Sunday. We won't have that again. We talked to our landscapers. So communication would help. We don't normally try to have um, deliveries or, or movement 
um, by commercial vehicles during off hours. Um, to the extent we do, sometimes it's emergency vehicles coming to the property. Snow plowing, it's, it's going to come when they have to come to keep the, the driveways clear and, for, and accessible. Um, but we try to manage things um, as good neighbors on this you know, very large 60-acre campus, which has been here for a very long time. And like I said, our neighbors have our contact info. They can reach out to us anytime they want. They don't have to wait for a site plan application. We, we really don't hear from them. Okay, and from this from particular project that we're hearing tonight, where's the closest house in feet? 300 feet you're talking about? I'll ask our engineer, but I think about 300 feet is about the, maybe a little. From the building to the property line where the residential properties are is 300 feet. And then they have another, if I had, probably about another 100 feet from the property line to the back of their house. Right. So we're close to 400 feet from building to building. All right. I, I think this board historically has proven it goes overboard to protect neighborhoods from uses like this. But the other thing that's kind of striking me is I, I think there's something missing here. If anyone's sitting out there thinking that we can stop every single light from a building from being seen. I mean, that's part of everyday life. You're going to see a light once in a while from a, from a house. Uh, if your parking lights, if your parking lot lights go out in this office building after the hours of use, and actually they shouldn't even have to be used since your building is supposedly a nine to five building, the you know, use of parking lot lights would be very limited. That's what we're dealing with. We have no power to make this applicant bulldoze his site and redo the whole project. Uh, Can I make one observation, Mr. Chairman, if I may, briefly? Um, in response to, to one of Ms. Shepard's comments about the guard keeps changing, it's tough to find us who to deal with. We've had two facilities directors in the past seven years. They are both really, really competent and responsive to our neighbors. Um, our last facility director w was in place during a prior approval. If you remember, we worked it out so that we could acquire and build a custom eight-foot um, off-white color fence that was earth tone immediately and install it immediately ahead of every other portion of the site development. I think Mark, remember that? Mark and Carl worked with us to, to, to fast-track the installation of the fencing which um, is well within our property line. Our property line goes beyond the fencing at a portion of it. So, um, and recently, our current facility directors, Mr. Airy, um, responded immediately to a neighbor's concern about a light somewhere else on the campus. So when I tell the board that we're trying to be good neighbors, I'm sincere and the applicant's sincere, and we know how to run our campus really well. We're mindful of all of our impacts, and, and if there were better communication with our neighbors during what I'll call the off-seasons of our appearances here, um, and I don't have any more forthcoming at this point, but, you know, we will respond, and we will respond appropriately and quickly, and that's been our sort of history. Um, thematically, every time we come to this board, we're trying to do something better. In 2013, we came to this board with a proposed betterment of our campus. In 2014, we came here with a signage improvement on DeMott Lane. In 2015, we came here to rectify a subdivision 300 square foot. We came to the planning board, the 300 square feet of lot area that was shifted along DeMott Lane. We came back to do a corrective deed swap and a minor subdivision for that up to the planning board, even though we really probably didn't even have to. I could have probably just filed a corrective deed, but we came to the board to do it. The applicant always comes in here proudly with their head high, trying to do something good for their campus and their use. And, and I think that's well, consistent with tonight. You know? We'll do the best we can, but everybody's got to understand that this is not a 69-acre vacant lot. And it is, we understand, a variance in a residential zone, but that was done, what, 20, 30 years ago. This, this facility is not going away. So we need to make it, and I think, I think, honestly, you probably have done everything you can do to mitigate things that are concerning, that are connected with this application. Now, is there anyone else who wishes to speak? All right, then we'll close to the public. Uh, anything more from the board or the applicant? I have a question about the, the parking lot lighting. Is it going to be lower to security levels after hours, or it's going to stay at the same illumination the entire time? 
good question. We were discussing that um, before the hearing and tonight as well. We intend to lower the, the parking area illumination to the point where our engineer can say it, it can comfortably say that it's at a safe level for people to traverse that parking area when it's not in typical usage hours. So in the evening hours when the office building is closed, it will be at the very least lowered and dimmed significantly, if not in fact turned off, if our engineer can tell the applicant that that is safe uh, and appropriate and the township engineer can sign off on that condition as well. So at the very least, dimmed when the building's not in use. Okay, so you're gonna revise the lighting plan. Well, the illumination, the, the location is not changing. I don't think the lighting throw is changing either, but we can add notes on there that discuss. Right. I don't think you have to revise your lighting plan to reflect evening dimming, would you? But typically we don't. I mean, we could we can stipulate on the plans the hours of full illumination. I mean, if there's an ordinance in place with the town or if the board sees fit for timing, that's can what we need to know. Certainly. The Anything else from the board? Anything else you want to add? No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we've taken up enough of the board's time tonight, and, and from the dialogue, I know the board understands and appreciates the application. Um, I just want to thank the board for your time this evening on the application. As always, um, very thorough um, review of our project, and we do appreciate that. Thank you. All right, board members, uh, any discussion or uh, someone like to put together a Resolution. Well, well, let's try a resolution first, and then I, I think I have something to say after that. Um, and Randy, the, let I um, uh, move that we grant the foundation of Oscar and Ella Wilf Campus for Senior Living Inc. Um, a a D1 use variance and the related um, bulk variances uh, necessary. Uh, to build a two-story office building uh, that will be used only by employees of the campus uh, for office uh, work uh, and the um, the uh, lighting uh, the, the building itself will be open from 8 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock at night and the lighting in the parking lot uh, will be reduced uh, to um, uh, security uh, levels uh, between uh, 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. the following morning. Um, the, uh, the applicant will also uh, plant a double row of um, uh, pine trees on the northern edge of the parking lot that uh, is closest to Magnolia Drive and will also plant um, <coughs> lower uh, shrubs on both sides of the double row of uh, pine trees, all of which will be subject to the approval of Mr. Healy. And I had requested an alternate landscaping scenario in case they don't build the drop-off. And the applicant will provide an alternate landscaping uh, scenario if it decides that it's not going to um, provide for a, um, uh, a drop-off and pick-up area. Okay. There was Second. Now, is there any further discussion? Yeah, I guess I've I've listened to what the um, the people in the audience have said, and and while um, a lot of what they said really has nothing to do with the the project that's in front of us, um, I think that um, uh, it would be better to uh, leave this applicant where he is with a one-story building and the minimal change uh, to, the, uh, to the operation. I think that um, the addition of a 10,000 square foot building is enough, uh, especially in view of the comments of the uh, people in the um, audience. Um, moving to a 17,500 square foot uh, increase um, and based upon the comments 
uh, in response to my thoughts about limiting the number of employees or um, uh, and the like, um, I think that uh, what they have so far is uh, what they should get. Uh, it shouldn't be any more than that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I disagree with the last speaker. Uh, uh, their, 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 their building is no higher than any, any of their homes, two-story homes, and, and it's way, it's way far. We, we, we view, we approve a lot of variances that, that are within 50 to 100 feet of, of someone else's home. That this is 300 feet away. It, it's in the, middle of the, in the middle of their property. I, I mean, uh, I, I can see why they're, they're trying to take advantage of these hearings for, for a different parcel, but I don't agree uh, with, with our last speaker. Uh, I, I think they, they have a right to, to have a, a two-story uh, building that looks like a home, maybe a long home, a wide home, but it, it doesn't look any, any worse than, than I, I, I drive on Magnolia Street every, uh, a couple of times a week as a shortcut to, to, uh, to, to in, in the park. And, and, and I, I think it's a very nice street. They have nice homes, but I don't think this building looks any worse than any of those homes there. Any other comments? Well, I, I second uh, the motion. What? Second his motion. Oh, yeah. Approval. Any other comments? I, I on no any other comments. discussion? Full board. Raymond Bettervid? Yes. Laura Grauman? Donald Johnson? Yes. Bruce McCracken? Yes. Alan Rich? Yes. Robert Shepard? No. And Chairman Thomas? Yes. I move for adjournment. Please. Please. Enough. Yes. Okay. Good luck with it, and I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Yes, did. And a second. All second. In favor. <laughs> Median adjournment.